Good, thank you. So welcome everyone and happy Saturday morning. I don't know about down there, but we're still got our Northern California fog here, but it's been beautiful weather and I'm spending as much time outside in the garden as I can. So, but I'm happy to take some time uh, this morning to talk to you all. So um, today we're talking about a book that I wrote, oh gosh, and it needs updating. I think it published in 2016 and um, it's called The Executive Functioning CEO of Self. And as Jody, as Jody, as Judy had mentioned, part of the reason that I wrote this was because I too was seeing such an impact in executive functioning deficits with the folks that we were working with. So just a brief overview, um, we're an allyship uh, organization up here in Northern California. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley. I was raised here. I was in high tech um, for a couple decades. Um, we moved to Chicago, or from Chicago to California uh, when I was three years old as part of the original move west for uh, the original Silicon Valley. So I know this area very well. Um, so just a brief overview about what we do at Evo Libri. So we've been serving, the, as I mentioned, the neurodivergent community since 2007. And we provide a variety of different services. And kind of ironically, this company has, uh, has grown very organically based on the skills that I saw that people were asking for, that they were struggling with and they needed help. So we've been very organic in our growth. So we provide therapy, we provide executive functioning um, training and scaffolding from ages 14 through adults. Uh, we teach independent living skills, both online and in person, and we're happy to be able to do it again in person now, uh, post-COVID. We do a lot of transition planning. This is something that I get uh, called in to do for, from school districts here. And actually, pretty much throughout the state of California on some tough cases, kids who are transitioning but don't really have a solid plan. And then employment. We've been Department of Rehab vendors now for many years, well over 10 now. Um, we were actually invited to become DOR vendors simply because DOR recognized that they didn't have the services necessary to help uh, neurodivergent folks uh, find success in employment. We're also a non-public agency, which simply means that we're vetted by the California Department of Education to provide um, services for school-aged kids. So that's who we are. So what I noticed years ago, um, and with my own kids, um, my oldest is now 30. He was diagnosed with what we call then Asperger syndrome. Um, and he uh, was really struggling with executive functioning. He was in many ways sort of a typical autistic kid where he was super smart in many, many areas, but he struggled with things like remembering to turn his homework in or writing something down or where did I put something? So he was struggling in a lot of ways that his neurotypical peers weren't. Um, I also noticed that kids like him got left behind, you know, so yes, he's really smart, but if he can't turn his homework in, clearly he's not that smart, right? You know, so there were, um, yeah, I won't even, well, it was, you know, sort of shaming strategies to try to force kids like him and other kids with ADHD or learning disabilities um, weren't accommodated appropriately. So they're, they were not actually able to do as well in school as they might have been if somebody had realized that the executive functioning piece in and of itself was a missing skill, not just laziness, not just orneriness, not just disinterest, right, which oftentimes executive functioning is labeled. And what I've also found through the years is that parents, um, well-meaning, have actually acted as that prefrontal cortex for their high school, middle school and high school kids. But they weren't teaching their kids how to handle these things on their own. They weren't giving them the skills that they needed to do for themselves. And, you know, that alone is kind of uh, critical. We want to teach people how to do for themselves, not do for them. But the problem that I was seeing that was most um, stunning was when these students were graduating from high school with a whole bunch of support from mom and dad, 
trying to, you know, okay, don't forget, you've got this, you know, sort of their, their executive directors, if you will, these kids then would go off to college. And they didn't have mom and dad there to remind them of all the things they needed. And so in the first quarter or two, we were seeing these kids fail out simply because they didn't have enough executive functioning to uh, handle their workload. So we'll back up just a little bit and talk about what the executive functions are. And there's um, no hard and fast rule here. So uh, when we talk about executive functioning, we're talking about the uh, processes that live in the prefrontal cortex of our brains. And these are sort of the what directs our actions and our behaviors, our, our conscious actions and behaviors throughout the day. And we know that executive functioning writ large, the whole group of them, uh, are not actually solidified until about age 25. You always wondered why back in the day you couldn't rent a car before age 25. It's for the same reason. We've known tangentially that this area was not fully uh, formed for many, many, many years, but we really didn't think about what that meant other than we won't let you have a car and drive it into a wall. Um, but we're asking kids oftentimes in you know high school and early college to do tasks, to manage uh, really complicated lives that they really don't have the brain power yet to do. I would also argue that for a lot of neurodivergent folks, I give them another couple of years to, uh, to develop these. We know that in many ways, autism, ADHD, et cetera, are neurocognitive delays, not deficits. People can continue to learn. They just aren't at necessarily across the board in the same place as their neurotypical peers at the same chronological age. Anyway, so what we're talking about here, generally speaking, and if you read different articles, you'll see different terms or different concepts used. The first is flexible thinking. How can I solve this? So what we're talking about here is hitting a wall of some sort, finding a problem or coming up against a problem and being able to stand back and to both use past thoughts, past ways we've solved a problem and to think creatively about how we can solve this problem. Um, it may seem kind of silly or simple, but this is a fundamental problem for many people um, with daily tasks, right? Um, I know that for some folks who have really poor executive functioning, for example, they may say, okay, I'm going to go into the kitchen and I'm going to cook dinner. And they go in and the kitchen's a mess and the dishwasher is full of clean dishes. And they just throw their hands up and say, I can't do it. So part of that is also distress tolerance. So flexible thinking would say, okay, so the kitchen's not in the state you expected it to be before you started cooking dinner how do you solve that problem, right? Without getting hopefully too upset. Um, working memory. So working memory is a little bit tricky. Um, and this is something that allows us to pick up where we left off, to be able to, when we're doing complex processes, to be able to hold something in our mind while we go to another screen, copy it, do our addition, take that information and put it on a third screen. So it's how much cash, if you will, if you think in, in, in computer terms, how much can I hold in my memory? How much can I hold in this buffer to transfer this thought or process to another task, right? It is a highly complex and not really well understood process. What we do know about working memory is that it appears to be somewhat finite meaning those who do not have great working memories, such as myself, uh, you really can't do a lot to improve it over time. Now, there's several programs out there, the names of which I don't even remember right now, that, um, uh, has, that state that they can improve working memory. The, the research that I've read, um, longitudinal research shows that Yes, if you continue to do these complex and somewhat expensive processes every dang day, you can keep your working memory a few points higher. But the minute you stop doing the program, it, you kind of level set again, right? So 
most of us for working memory, it is what it is. And so really when we're talking about executive functioning deficit in working memory, we're talking about cheats and hacks that we can do to keep ourselves uh, sane. I always have a pad of paper, for example, by my desk. That's how I do it. And my kids know, and my kids learned at a very early age, I had crappy working memory and they loved playing video games with me that, um, <laughs> that uh, needed working memory, like card sort, card match, that kind of thing. They loved beating me because they knew I have crummy working memory. Um, the next one is time management. This is probably the one we talk the most about, about, right? How, where does the time go? You know, for any parents online, you know, hey, we're going to have dinner in 10 minutes. Please finish up that game. Um, and they come back 15 minutes later and the kid is, you know, I, I'll be done in a second. I just got to find a place to save. So this is that time blindness that many ADHD folks and autistic folks deal with and other people as well. Um, so time management it, is really a tricky one. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that show that people with good time management feel time kind of in their bodies. So I have really good time management, for example. And I can tell you when I'm working on my computer, writing up a slide deck like this one, I can just have a thought about, huh, I think it's about noon. And I'll look at my watch and darn it if it isn't just about noon. I'm probably taking in a lot of sense, a lot of sensory information in my environment. For example, I note that it's the sun is probably a little bit higher overhead. Uh, I notice that my tummy is starting to growl because it's almost lunchtime. So there are things that I am picking up in my environment that help me pick up the clues about how much time has passed. And for people who are not paying attention to some of those things, not purposely, it's just not getting into their conscious mind or subconscious mind, time management is very, very difficult. Planning an organization, this has to do with... Um. Jen? Yes. Oh yeah, the one that we discussed in time management. Um, if one of those personal trainers comes in and if they waste time, it's not good. You have to do it right away. That's right, that's right. Um, the next one is planning an organization. So this has to do with sequencing and prioritization, right? And being able to ascertain what is the most important thing to do or what should I be working on now? Right. And this requires sort of a reshuffling of priorities throughout the day. Right. Oftentimes we're working on something and we need to be working on it now until something more urgent comes in. And then we need to shift our priorities and say, oh, dang, I guess I'll do that after lunch. Right. So, for example, why do we go to the store before we cook? And for organization and this one, that was kind of cracks me up. Why do we not put our shoes in the kitchen cupboard? Why do we have certain places in our house where things go? It's to it's a shortcut for our brain, right? If we're looking for a Band-Aid, we're not going to be looking typically in the garage or in the car. We're going to go to our bathroom because that's how our brains like things to be sorted. And so we've learned how to adapt, put things where they belong so we can find them again. Now, probably the most critical of all of this is the self-monitoring or the meta thought, right? This is thinking about thinking, the, the ability to kind of oversee all these processes to make sure that we're moving forward on a given task, right? And this can be difficult. This one also includes things like activation, impulse control, barrier removal, and management of the necessary tasks, including knowing when you're stuck and when you need to ask for help. This one is in many ways sort of a learned response to our executive functioning, particularly when we hit a barrier or we're stuck. Okay, so all of this was going on and I saw all of these challenges in pretty much most of my clients, not all, but most. And so I decided, being a technical writer once long, long ago, that I wanted to write a book about this. And I wanted to make it usable because at the time when I reviewed what was already out there, they were books, really good books, but they were written about the theory and about what's happening. They didn't write it in such a fashion that it was actually teaching the skills. 
And when we think about teaching, we think about not just telling somebody how to do something, but actually have them participate in that lesson and actually have a piece that they have to do to embed the learning. So I decided, hang on, I gotta move something. There we go. Um, that it was important also though, because of the people that I'm addressing this to, y'all are super smart. So it was important for me to explain the science behind it, not go into gross detail, but to explain a little bit about how people think and why people do things the way they do, right? And to make it practical, right? Theory is great. I love theory. I can read theory all day long. But in order to teach skill, skills, we have to move from the theoretical to the practical. And that was what I attempted to do. And come on, for some reason I'm not, there we go. So what I did was I broke this down into slightly different domains. And what I did was I thought about it in, in terms of domains of use rather than the actual, the specific um, deficit that we were addressing, although some of them closely align. And when I thought about this, you know, I thought about how did I become so good at time management? Because it's a learned skill for me. Um, I probably am in borderline ADHD. And uh, I certainly didn't learn any of this really in high school um, or, or maybe not even in college, but I learned a lot of these skills, frankly, when I was in corporate uh, and what classes I thought did I take? Well, you know, for those of us who are my age, you know, you may have heard of, you know, uh, the seven habits of highly successful people. And a lot of the skills that I learned in that class, which I took a, an extensive class in that, really kind of helped me understand executive functioning. So some of this actually pulls from that. So I wanted to think about uh, logical use rather than specific executive functioning. So first, we talk in the first chapter of the book about time management, because it's kind of the biggie, right? So we think about executive functioning, managing time, and here's where we talk about it, right? or how we talk about it, procrastination, activation, completion, restarting. So for example, if you get interrupted, how do you get back in? Handling interruptions. Those are the biggest concerns, which we talk about in that first chapter. And what we talk also about is how to prioritize, how to sequence, how to improve your focus. That's a really important thing. We do a lot of coaching and Focus is probably one of the most important things we're dealing with now, especially post pandemic and rewarding. And when we talk about rewarding, we're not talking about mommy letting you have a bowl of ice cream because you got your homework done. We're talking about how you set up your own rewards for yourself, right? Which is kind of human nature, right? So we want you to be able to say, if I get this job done and I get it done well, I'm going to take a two hour break and go video game and just do nothing. And then I'm going to come back and then I'm going to work again, right? How you set up your own personal rewards, whatever is important to you. Space management. Um, <laughs> for parents, this is a big one and it may seem like a losing battle um, when we're talking about, you know, kids domains or young adults domains, you know, losing important items, forgetting important items that are stuffed in our backpacks, messy rooms, all of this. Now, I don't believe in uh, pristine living arrangements. I think that most of us have, you know, our different, what I call a uh, level of status factor that we're uh, happy with. I, um, and I think that that's appropriate. There is no right way to keep a home or to have levels of cleanliness. Um, and I do think that kids tend to learn levels of cleanliness as they age. But we're also talking about, you know, can you put your hands on something that you need, right? You know, do you know where stuff is? Yes, you may have stacks of paper, but you know about halfway through, halfway through that stack is that one paper you're looking for. That's all I care about, right? Is really not losing control, not being able to find things that you really need. Um, and here we're talking about, you know, place for everything, getting back to why do you not keep your shoes in the kitchen cabinet? It has to do with the way our brains are structured and how we structure as humans information in our brain. And we want to try to mind map how we organize stuff intellectually 
to how our physical domain is. Anyhow, so place for everything, 15 minute cleanups. I'm really big on this. This is especially useful for parents with little kids. Um, and the archaeological dig when you have a whip, sorry, when you have a really big mess that you're trying to uh, go through. And I need to hide my floating panel. Hang on just a second because it keeps popping up where I don't want it to be. There we go. Um, and bookending. This is important also for space management. One of the biggest concerns we hear, especially with teenagers living at home, is why will he never empty the dishwasher? Well, because he doesn't know. I like him dishwashers to being somewhat like Schrodinger's cat. You don't know if it's clean or dirty until you open it. And most teenagers are not going to open a dishwasher unless they're looking for something. So you need to bookend or sequence things together. Every time you come in for your afternoon snack, after you get home from school, you must, while you're heating your burrito, check to see if the dishwasher is clean or dirty, and if it's clean, you need to empty it. So that it becomes, first I always do this, I heat the burrito, and then I'm doing this while I'm waiting it, waiting for it. So that's the bookend, first, second. Virtual management. Um, virtual management becomes an issue later uh, when computers are used for most work, right? You know, certainly we really uh, got a mega dose of this during the pandemic. Um, I've had clients who've lost important documents who are overwhelmed by, you know, their desktop with 150, you know, uh, de uh, documents on it. So replicate space management. How do we apply what we've learned in space management to our computer? Again, so we can find things. What is a logical sequence or order for how you name folders, how you name files so that you can search for them, that type of thing. Memory management. So this one goes, this one's a little bit interesting. And, and it was really interesting for me to research because I had some ideas about how it worked, but not, uh, didn't go into depth. Um, so this has to do with how memories are encoded for future retrieval, which is exactly what learning is when you think about it. Because we don't just, you know, learning is not just a set of things we do. Um, in the physical world, and then voila, you know, our brain always has it. And I think that it's important to understand how our brain stores information, why it stores it the way it does, and how we can influence or improve how we learn things. And we talk about why multimodal learning is so important, for example, why having more than one of our senses involved in acquisition of information makes that, um, makes that actual memory more retrievable down the road. And also talks about the strengths and weaknesses that many of us have. Again, memory management is one of my weakest. So I've had to do a lot of scaffolding for myself around this. And how do they, you know, how do they interact? So this one was an interesting bit. And then project management. So I believe that pretty much anything we do that has more than one step is a project, right? So whenever we're doing something, whether again, pardon me, it's cooking dinner or planning a party or um, trying to figure out when the best time to go uh, up to CDA's game or whatever, whenever we're doing something that's got more than one step, it's a project. And learning how to do a project, what the sequencing, again, I get back to sequencing and prioritizing uh, need to look like, why we do things first, second, third, fourth, why we do them way in advance or right before, understanding how those components work together to really make a nice consistent project that's efficient, that's an important thing to do. Now, let me... Sometimes it wants to click and sometimes it doesn't. So the last three in the book deal with information management, thought management, and obstacle management. So information management, how can we make better decisions, particularly with conflicting input? I've known a lot of clients who um, get stuck in making decisions. They don't really understand how you arrive at a given decision, especially one that's complex. And so 
oftentimes what happens is we just have stasis. We have the refusal to make a decision at all. The fear, of course, is I might make the wrong decision. So part of this is assuring uh, our clients that most, though not all, but most of our decisions, we make decisions every day. Some of them turn out pretty well, some of them maybe not so much, but very few decisions we make have life altering results, right? So it's better to learn as you go, make decisions, learn from the results of that decision rather than to not make a decision at all, generally, not always. So, but how do we handle all that conflicting information? So in this, we talk about how to, how to think about the different pros and cons. And that's actually one of the tools I teach in this. Write out your list of pros and cons, really weigh them. You know, are these all equal? Are some of these more important? So talk about, you know, the vital importance. And, you know, oftentimes we get waylaid by information. We say, oh, but, you know, if I do this and I can't call Nana. And it's like, well, were you going to call Nana anyway? But no, but if I do this, I won't be able to. <laughs> so we have ways of kind of um, convoluting our process. So to be honest about how we're convoluting so that we can make more rational decisions. Um, the next one really should have probably been called CBT light because this talks about the thought barriers that we throw up. Um, and cognitive behavioral theory is a good starting place. It's certainly not the only therapeutic intervention um, that I would ever uh, think about for a person who is neurodivergent or neurotypical for that matter. But it is important to understand how our thoughts actually impact our ability to be successful in life and to do the things we want to do. And I have seen all kinds of people who self-sabotage, who um, have hold uh, really invalid thoughts about why they can't move forward with something they want to do. And so really having honest conversations with ourselves or if necessary with others about what that negative or contrary thought is doing to us in terms of holding us back. I think it's really, really important to understand just how powerful our own thoughts are in holding us back. And the last chapter in the book is what I call obstacle management. This is, um, <laughs> this one is, was kind of fun because what I'm asking people to do is to prepare for the unknown. And that seems kind of odd. How do you prepare for something you don't know? Well, you can keep yourself from being vulnerable. And what I mean by that is one of my greatest anecdotes was when my son, my oldest, was in high school. I think it was even in his senior year. He had a paper that he needed to write and he belly ached about it and he didn't start it and this, that, and the other thing. I kept saying, you know, you need to get going on that paper. Oh, I know. But, you know, and being autistic, he's like, but it will only take me this much time to do it. He had it all figured out. So really, I don't have to start it until 7.05, you know, and then I've got enough time to do it. Anyhow, so he finally on Sunday, it was due Monday morning, of course, on Sunday, he starts working on it. And it's now like 10 o'clock or so. And I decide to go to bed and I tell him such. And he's like, you're going to bed? I'm like, hey, dude, I'm not staying up. You're the one who didn't get the paper started earlier. I'm going to bed. I got, I got sleep, man. And so I went to bed and at about four in the morning, no, it was earlier, about two in the morning, he comes in. Mom, mom. I'm like, what? He wakes me up in the middle of the night because the printer's out of toner. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And what exactly do you think I'm going to do at 2 a.m.? And he's like, well, I don't know. And I said, dude, even if there was a store that was open, a 24 hour, you know, inkjet printer store that I could get up and go get you toner, I'm not doing it. You had plenty of time to, to work on this earlier. So he figured it out. He realized, okay, fine, finish the, you know, put it on a thumb drive took it into school, printed it out in the library before school turned it in. But 
at the end of the day, I explained to him, dude, this is exactly why I want you to do things a little bit earlier, not weeks earlier, but even a day earlier. Or even if you'd finished it by noon on Sunday, we would have realized you were out of we were out of ink and I could have gone to the store, but you pushed it so far, you set yourself up, you made yourself vulnerable to something that was going to blow everything apart. Nice job fixing it, but let's learn the lesson. So all of this is great information, but to me, again, as I said earlier, it has to be a learning exercise, right? We have to have ways to learn these skills. So what I came up with, um, and this is written really for uh, kid, people 16 through 30, although adults have read it and found it useful, is uh, to do lists, to do fill-in charts, and to, to do journaling. So I want people to actually stop and think about, like, for example, what their barriers are. Um, what are the steps they need to take? I want them to have charts to understand who they are and how they function and where their own weaknesses in are. And then journaling to work down as sort of as a self-reflection about what's working and what's not. So here is a list. Um, this is in the beginning of the book, my seven important things. I want people to really talk about and think about what am, what am I trying to do with my life? And it doesn't matter whether you're in school or you're working or you're, re you're retired. I want people to really understand what are the things I'm trying to accomplish with my life? How many hours do I actually spend doing this? And how many hours do I actually need? Because I want to see if there's a delta. You know, if you're only spending four hours a week studying and you really should be spending 12, then we know that there's something that we need to flip, right? And I also want to put downtime and social life in there because those are really important to all of us. We all need downtime. We all need some social. And here's a fill in chart. This has to do with reactivity um, and how quickly we're distracted, right? And some people are, some people aren't. And so I want people to have more thought about how they're reacting to their environment. So for example, number three, I have to read every email immediately as it comes in or I feel uncomfortable. I, we do a lot of coaching with professionals. We're working with a bunch of people at Salesforce right now, neurodivergent people at Salesforce. And this kind of thing keeps them from getting their work done, right? They just can't. So if you're that reactive and you have to, oh, you know, it's that sort of ADHD, ooh, squirrel kind of thing, then we need to find a way to kind of calm down your sensory input throughout the day so you can be more effect effective. And then journaling, you know, I want people to journal. I want them to really be reflective on what's difficult for them. So all of that together, then bringing it together into an action plan. So at the end of the book, there's a set of tables to fill out strengths, weaknesses, and workarounds. I really want people to understand themselves. This is not about being bad or being good. This is about understanding who we actually are, right? Good, bad, and indifferent doesn't really matter. I, and again, I have tons of, of um of weaknesses, and I've had to learn how to work around them. There's nothing wrong with that. We just got to know them, right? And then bringing the information into the here and now, what is it that I can do differently today in either school or work or whatever we're trying to do to manage the challenges that I face and to really give the people who read this book sort of an opportunity to commit, to create an affirmation along with an action plan that teaches them, okay, you know, I will do my best to do, use these skills. And guess what? It won't be perfect. It never is. So sometimes we have to go back and do it again. And every time we do that, it's not a failure. It's a layering of skills, right? I'm getting better and better and better and better over time, right? It's a little bit like running a marathon. You know, go to the gym once and then try to do a marathon the next day. These things take time. So CEO of Self, um, the two other books uh, that are currently in print, I have, a, I have a fourth that's out of print that I had to rewrite, but I gotta get less busy to find time to do it. Um, Life Launch, which is our curricula for uh, independent living skills and Workplace Adaptability, which is our curricula for pre-employment. And all three of these, by the way, have classes associated with them. 
and uh, workplace adaptability and CEO of self, you can access those classes through Department of Rehab. Life Launch also uh, is funded by DOR now, but it's alive and in person. So you have to be in our office uh, in uh, the summertime to be able to do that. And that's all I had. So I've got plenty of time to talk or to answer questions or whatever else anybody else would like. Thanks so much, Jan. Okay, I will call on people, I guess. And I didn't really, I saw a lot of discussion in the chat, not a lot of questions, although here's one. Is the department, uh, let's see what it was at. Is the Department of Rehab for all of California? Um, <laughs> yes and no. So Department of Rehab does indeed serve all of California. However, we are not vendorized yet in the entire state. However, we are vendorized in Orange County and in San Diego counties. And that is due to Ms. Judy. Because, <laughs> you know, seriously, she helped with that. And it's really kind of silly the way it's set up. And there's some move afoot, Judy, just so you know, that when you become a vendor, that you can either become a vendor at a local level or at the state level. And they really should have just allowed us to do that because we're having to go um, talk to each and every damn district. And it's it's really silly. So we're trying to get um, vendorized right now in central in Modesto, which is the northern Central Valley. And it's first off, you have to kind of go with your hat in hand. Hi there. We have these services and we have a consumer in your area who really wants our services. Can we please get vendorized? And then it's this whole process. You have to ask permission from your home vendor to vendorize in another area. It is so 1980s. And yeah. it's like, we need to get going, people. So, yeah. Let me just pause for a second and just explain why I was really eager for Jan to have Evo Libre vendorize for Orange County. And a lot of the people that I've spoken with have college educations are want a career versus want a job. And Evo Libre is unique and that's what they do. They, they, I mean, they can help you find a job, but they are much more attuned to helping like, I'm looking at Savag, like helping someone with a computer science degree find employment. So, so that was one aspect of Evo Libre that I, I, really liked and felt that we were missing in Orange County. The second is just with this training that John, Jan shared on um, executive functioning, and she described some of the other courses or other books that she had and how there are courses available. Jan's unique in actually being aware of the challenges for our community and coming up with training and a way of addressing I mean none of us is born perfect and so we all have things that we have to work on and Jan's been really good at identifying where where those issues are that we typically run into and how to improve ourselves so it was for those two reasons that I I really um work with Jan and we work with the OR a little, I helped a little bit. I think Jan did a lot of the work, but um, to push for Evo Libre to um, accept clients down here. And so I'm, I'm really well, happy that they are, are available. You, you um, established the need, Judy. And that was really, that's the, that's the first thing, right? You know, so it really is, um, you know, Neurotalents down in SoCal is doing great things now with DOR. Um, I think there's one other organization. I'm not sure who it is. There's, there's a few. There's Avacon and there's Grit and Flow, but they're not necessarily vendored with DOR. Well, yeah, like, Neurotalents yeah. is. Neurotalents is vendored. Oh, I didn't know they got there. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so there's very few in DOR that provide the service. And, you know, I'll be brutally honest, you know, DOR maintains you know, and not all of them, but they're still, again, back in the 80s, they're thinking about disability as hard of hearing, vision impaired, and physical disabilities. They're not thinking about neurodivergence. And so they've got a long way to catch up. So that's part of the challenge. Um, also, somebody mentioned that you're moving to San Mateo County. Um, we're vendorized throughout the Bay Area. So every place in the Bay Area, we are covered. And um, 
and we're also, yeah, we're also covered northern, it's weird, northern California. So from uh, Oregon state line, all the way down to and through the Bay Area, cutting off that part of Sacramento. So we haven't gotten Sacramento, the, the valley taken care of up to Orange County. And, um, and we haven't done the coast south. I mean, we're vendorized down to Gilroy, Martinez. I mean, it's also part and parcel of the way that DORs cut up the state. It's really, I mean, Judy will tell you, you know, we were trying to figure out, okay, do we need to be vendorized in OC or in San Diego? And came to find out we really needed to be vendorized in both. Oh, right. Of the way the carve out was, and it's like, oh my gosh, people, you know, it's like gerrymandering for political parties. It's crazy. Anyway. Well, yes. Yeah. Just to, to explain, DOR splits Orange County. Okay, and they split it into kind of North Orange County, which becomes part of which they merge with San Gabriel for whatever reason. And then South Orange County is merged with San Diego. Right. It's a very different. Both of those are very different communities in Orange County. And right. so it so a lot of times as we work through things, and I think Jen and I went through this with her, is, is like we're working with one office and we realize that we don't have our problem solved until we work with the other office. So it's a it's an unusual thing. But it looks like we're um, it looks like we're starting to get questions in the chat and please raise your hand as well. Uh, so Samiak asked, do you have an app for your workbook? That's a good I question. I don't have an app. Um, I and I'll tell you why. Apps are hecka expensive to um, to develop and develop well. There are some other apps out there, but this is really meant to be more of a learning tool, not a reminding tool, right? You know, so there's there's there's, there's a lot of tools out there that will do things like remind you or have you help you with problem solving. And again, it's not to say that I couldn't take that material and reformulate it like into a guided um, decision-making tree, which would be kind of cool. I, you know, I'm 64 years old. I've got 22 employees. I work my ass off. <laughs> I just, I, I, you know, if somebody would only give me $5 million so I could hire, you know, a bunch of people and I could go off and be the brainchild. I love that idea. I'm super creative. I love systems answers to problems. I just don't have the time in my life to do it. Sadly, sadly, sadly. You, you know, you know, Jan, there's, I'm, um... I'm trying to remember that a life, a life, uh, I can try to think of their name, but they, they have, they have an app for, that they use with companies to keep people on task and to There's rate themselves during them. the day, uh, SERPA. Yep. SERPA, yeah. life SERPA, life, life SERPA. SERPA. Yeah, and, and it's, it's okay. And that might be that might be interesting. They're, they're really not into consumers. They're more into working with businesses. But if somebody took their app and combined it with your your stuff, it would be a real interesting marriage. It would be, and I know the folks at Life Sherpa. Um, I, I yeah. You know, I know. It's like it, if yeah. you had time. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time thing, man. It's that time thing. Um, so I'm just kind of going through uh, some of these questions here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, buy alcohol at 21 unless I know. That's silly. Um, let's I think see. if you go down to towards the bottom and work yeah, your way backwards, yeah. I think that's is experience needed to have executive functioning formed? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's a light, it's one of those things that you definitely get better at it as you go. And it also has everything again to the to the uh, solidification of your prefrontal cortex. I think that that's really important. Um, uh, 63 year olds with ADHD seem to be get worsening with age. Welcome to, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but yes, um, I have that same problem and you just, you just continue to use all your scaffolds. Um, we do start losing our short-term memory in particular. Um, let's see, don't have an app. 
uh, vendorization just can we discuss kid questions it depends on how old I, we only work with kids uh, 14 through adults so we are not we don't work with smaller children simply because there's so many services out there um, specific services offered online and self pay rates Mary if you contact us at intake uh, at evolibri.com. We'll be happy to get you all of our information. Um, you can go to uh, evolibri.com and learn more about the um, about the services that we offer. And we do self-pay. We also will can accept self-determination uh, monies through a regional center. It's the only engagement we'll ever have with regional center because they pay crap. Um, how can, go ahead, Judy. Oh, no, no, that was me wiping my eye. Oh, okay. Uh, how can someone with executive functioning issues succeed in Silicon Valley? Um, honestly, probably one of the best things to do, Savag, is get a coach. Um, Department of Rehab can pay for coaching. Um, it's kind of a pain to get the services. Um, we do a lot of private pay coaching. Uh, we have a lot of clients in Silicon Valley. We also, again, with Salesforce, we have clients now in Canada, in the UK, and other parts of the world. And most of the issues we're dealing with are executive functioning for people who are either autistic or ADHD. Um, we also do peers. Um, Preteen, again, we do have one cohort we run for starting at 12 or 13. Um, we do offer that uh, via hybrid. We prefer the kids to be live, of course, Olivia, but we do do it hybrid. We do not take insurance. Again, um, we're too small, but we will offer a super bill with all the uh, appropriate things that you need uh, to submit. Um, how do you apply for Eva Libri? For private pay, again, you can contact us at intake at evalibri.com. Or if it's Department of Rehab, you go through the Department of Rehab first and then ask to have your case transferred to Eva Libri. Um, guys, directly link. So we're definitely a separate organization. Uh, make no doubt uh, <laughs> about it. Nobody controls me. Um, no, and that's part of the reason I went into business for myself, you know, and I own and run Eva Libri only because I really wanted to make sure that the services we provide are really top notch. Also, and perhaps ironically, we are a fee for service. We are not a nonprofit. And a lot of people kind of wrinkle their nose going, oh, well, she's all about the money. Actually, it's it's not for that reason at all. Um, and if you looked at my income, you would see that if we were a nonprofit, I'd be making easily twice as much money, easily. The reason why we're a for-profit, I have had lots of experience working with and for nonprofits. You spend so much time chasing money in nonprofits of the ilk that we're talking about, the organization I have getting a grant here, getting a grant there. There's so much that you have to do trying to chase the money that in my mind for an organization like we're running, we would actually, it would be to the detriment of the services we provide. I wanted to be able to design services I felt were important to share with the world not which had strings attached by Autism Speaks, by the Society for Autism. I didn't want anybody else telling me what they thought I needed to do, number one. Number two, the proof is in the pudding. If our services were not up to snuff, and if our services were not neurodivergent affirming, meaning that neurodivergent people themselves found us to offer beneficial services and to be kind and generous and truly open to listening to them, we would have been out of business many years ago. So part of the reason we do Department of Rehab and are a non-public agency is so people with less funding can still access our services through those channels. But I never wanted to ever undermine our ability to provide the services I felt as a parent and as an advocate were necessary. Uh, that's enough of that, probably. Um, let's see. Uh, there was one, how did you get the name Evo Libre? Oh, oh yes. There. 
So, <laughs> um, I, I love words. Uh, once upon a time, I was an English lit major, and I've always loved words. Um, and so I wanted to come up with something that wasn't Jan Johnston, Tyler, and Associates. Whoa, I thought that was so gross. And I didn't want it to be, you know, one of these words or, you know, there's so many, you know, teen counseling or whatever. So I came up with the Evo Libri. Evo is evolve and Libri is to be liberated. So evolve and be liberated. And as I like to joke, also the domain was available. <laughs> that was great <laughs> when I was starting the, uh, the so, group. Yeah, so Jan S Sabad has his hand up. Sabad, I'm calling on you. You can unmute yourself. I don't have my hand up. I was just- uh, No, no, not, not that Sabad. <laughs> Sabad, there's Sorry. Sabad and there's Sabad. <laughs> so, uh uh, oh, oh, so I'm sorry, sorry. poor Sabah um, keeps getting confused when I say that. He's so used to me saying his name. Yes, Sabah. Um, I now work for Catella Deli for two days. Yay! Congratulations. That's great, Sabad. Because we, we recognize one person on the show called Love on the Spectrum. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sabad is in Love on the Spectrum for everybody. I love it. I thought I recognized you. That's wonderful. Uh, I love that uh, does, show. does your son watch it? Um, no, he doesn't, but I do because okay. I'm the one who likes that kind of TV. He's he's he doesn't watch TV much. He, he's um, uh, uh, does does is, is your son still single? No, actually, he has been in a relationship now for about five years. Five years, and when is he going to get married? I don't know. I don't know if he will get married. My son is gay. And uh, he has, he and his boyfriend have been living together for several years with two great big lovely dogs. And they uh, both, of them on the, both of them on the spectrum? Yes, they are. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking I need to find a girlfriend who is also on the spectrum who wants to get married too. Yeah. Okay, so Bob, we're, right. we're, gonna, we're gonna move on to the next question, okay? Right. Oh, okay. no problem, no problem. I'm just, I just uh, wanna make sure everybody gets a chance. Um, so uh, Diane has questions about being in, uh, in Los Angeles, and I know it's possible to get services from you in Los Angeles. Do you want to describe the yes. painful process so, you have to go through? <laughs> so Diane, 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 contact me. Um, we, we want to get into uh, DOR in LA because obviously it's huge. And, um, but we need somebody again, much like Judy, just to, to wave and say, y'all need to talk to Evo Libre. So um, if you want, please contact me an email. Um, uh, Judy can provide it here. And um, <coughs> if you are and you're working with the regional center and DOR, so if you are at DOR, what would be useful is, and I can get some help kind of in the wings, but really the best way that this works is somebody in the area has to say, we need these people here. And then once that happens, then we can kind of start doing the background process. Now for regional center, depending on what <coughs> services you're after, you might be able to do the self-determination payment. Um, but the best thing to do, Diane, is to reach out to me an email and, and we can do it. Um, my phone number is on, oh, well, here, let me just put it in here so you have it. If that's a direct message. Let me hang on just a minute. Uh, everyone in the meeting. So my uh, probably even better, I'm going to put this in because she's going to get back to you faster. And then our phone number, although I'll tell you, better to email us. We're email folks. And here's our phone. So best way to contact us is, uh, is to email intake, ask your question. She'll forward it to me. She is on all the time and not all the time, but the person who's at the end of that email, Cynthia, is our intake coordinator. And she sort of channels everything. So if you say we're interested in you know, I heard Jan speak interested in uh, getting vendorized in DOR. She'll send that to me and we'll get going on that. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Diane. I'm sorry, my son, I kind of had to force him to listen to this. <laughs> He's bulking. <laughs> you want to go to Japan? Well, you're not. So unless you come and listen to this. I mean, we got started late. <laughs> so when you have a young man, college educated and really first job, right? Um, 
it's been a struggle. And do you know of any agencies, at least here in Southern California, who might be, I mean, it's very, uh, what do I say? Excuse me, I, I hope I don't offend anybody here, high functioning and- um, Low <laughs> need is what we're saying now, low need, low barrier, low need. Low need, thank you. I'm just, thank you, low need. And I find that a lot of agencies uh, direct some of these low need individuals to places that maybe address a different need. Okay. Maybe a higher need. Right. So, so, so I, how do I get you We're in the middle of self-determination? I don't know. I'm on my IF left. I would love enough to do IF. So <laughs> I could just do the spending plan and go. And I'm also, you know, background is in law. Do you have any suggestions? And maybe I just get you on private pay now. Um, and maybe it's not fair to ask you what your fees are, but I, I want to move forward. I'd rather have someone else pay for it than me because honestly don't have a lot of money. And do you have any other places, at least my kid could get started now until we finish self-determination? I don't know of many places down in SoCal, I'll be brutally honest. Um, and, and only because it, it would require pretty much a full-time job of me Googling every single day to see what pops up. Yeah, and what's yeah. I, Jan, I just want to say that on mon Monday, Diane, we yeah. have our annual neurodiversity at work session and we'll have uh jessica lee from neuro uh neuro talent neuro talent yeah at works and and also we'll have um hillary kokenda and rebecca beam from zavicon both of them uh, both organizations address the lower need um individuals on the spectrum so um come to that and you'll learn a lot about some things that are happening in the South right. life. We'll do and it. And it also depends um, because that's sort of our sweet spot too um, is, you know, we take a slightly different approach, Diane. So for example, um, uh, NeuroTalents right now has a program where they're teaching people how to work in the insurance industry. And Zavicon um, has a slightly different take on it. We, we're really different than those kinds of organizations. Um, and there's not to say that there's not need. And those are great organizations. But we flip the script. So we look at each individual person based on their needs, what their education or lack of education is, what they're interested in, what their abilities are where they want to go in life. So it's really more kind of old school career counseling and career development, right? So if we have somebody who has come to us uh, with a degree in history and they have no desire to go into insurance or computer science, which is what, or finance, which are what the vast majority of these programs address because somebody decided 15 years ago, oh, autistic people are really good at this set of things, which is really kind of crazy, right? Because for every uh, computer science person who's walked in our doors, we have somebody who's a graphic designer, somebody who is interested in working with animals. I mean, it's, you know, it just kind of brought, it's very broad. So we want to help each person find their own niche, which is a little bit different, more time consuming, and a little bit more expensive, depending on, you know, how you slice it. Um, but I think that it's much more important to marketing uh, business, not computers. There you go. So I'm not sure that the programs uh, in SoCal are really necessarily the right one. So I, yeah. Would, yeah. And, and again, it's not that the yeah. programs are great. Don't get me wrong. It's just that they're not inclusive. We don't have enough of them in different areas yet. I would say that the thing that um, Evo Libre, I mean, they're all excellent program and they're all, each one of those individuals is, has a lot of passion and is working hard and each per, each of them have different opportunities, et cetera. But the thing that Evo Libre's strength is, is the fact that Jan has been doing this for so long and has built such a solid foundation in terms of, it's not that she's just one, helping one person, she's looking at this holistically. And so she's created a lot of, a curriculum that is useful for everyone. So, and she has, at least up in Northern California, has some amazing connections. So, so um, each one of them, 
I would talk to each, if it were me, and yeah. I would talk to each one of them and Definitely. figure out who is the best one for me to partner with, yep. given my funding, yep. given my, what my needs are, given, you know, et cetera. And it may be that you decide to use Evo Libre for two years, get trained, get all that. And then maybe later on you do something else because it may be that at different phases, you need different things. But I, they're they're all excellent. But I, I think what Jan has is just an amazing curriculum, and amazing contacts up in Northern California, and a a process that that has been honed through the years. Yep. And I'm just yeah, we're in Santa Clara, which is uh, South Bay uh, Bay Area. Um, but again, you know, we serve. We try to serve throughout the state. Um, and in many ways, the pandemic was a blessing. We were already providing remote services, but it was very difficult to get DOR, for example, to understand that this was a good way to <laughs> provide services until the pandemic, right? And then it's like, oh, oh, I guess, yeah, that, that actually does work. So it really helped us in some regards. But yeah, and I think that, you know, my goal really, uh, you know, in terms of a strategy is help neurodivergent people learn the skills that, that are impacting them in a day-to-day -day life. And at the same time, work at a higher level, instead of trying to fit people into a company, I wanna blow these companies apart. And I want really for us to have a voice in uh, diversity and inclusion, because uh, it, it just, you know, living here in Silicon Valley all my life, I've seen how, Neurodivergence was so common when I was in the was in a work. You know, we had I, I know I had neurodivergent employees. I'm certain of it. And now it's gotten so hard for those same people to keep or get jobs. And it's really, you know, we've really kind of ruined tech, in my opinion, by um, this massive hiring from out of the state and you know recruiting people who will accept the lowest amount of money and uh, not really looking at the talent that's already here. Also, just not having any tolerance for any people who think differently. You know, and frankly, that's gonna kill Silicon Valley, by the way. It's killing the likes of Twitter. Um, you know, if you have a bunch of people who have, you know, kind of radical ideas. Anyway, uh, no, it really didn't have much effect. Uh, SVB, you know, got slapped and they should have gotten slapped. Um, that was just laziness. And I've got lots to talk about, about why Silicon Valley is in the state it's in right now, but that's really not the topic today. Anyway, but yeah, in terms of good idea to state, you know what? Um, I always tell people that there, first off, there only should be a box on an application, a job application that asks if you have a disability or not. I say, check that box. Does anybody, they should not, they cannot ask you it, what your disability is or to disclose. Whether or not you disclose your um, neurodivergency before, during, or after hire really depends on the job, really depends on you, really depends on so many things. So that is a decision that we make with our clients as we go through the process. And um, I think and I think an important um part of the decision is one what the culture of the company is yes. and the hiring manager to make sure that 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 you're in concert with them and that that they're a company that is trying to increase their neurodiversity so i think it's really important to know where they're coming from and second of all it may not be that you talk so much about your diagnosis but more about your preferences and what's going to make you more effective and finding right. good ways to communicate that. So, right. and so we talk, we talk yeah. about we talk about asking for accommodations without disclosing, which you know, depending, I, I would say that's usually the most effective way. I mean, if I I believe I wish I could live in a world where everybody could be loud and proud you know, much the way, and I, I think we're getting there, much the way, you know, somebody might sort of disclose that they are LGBTQ, you know, which again is a very private decision, but a lot of people do disclose that in the workplace. 
Um, I would love to be able to have people who are neurodivergent also be able to disclose in the same way. Um, but what we do for uh, accommodations is, uh, you know, things around, um, sometimes I get overwhelmed when I'm in meetings and I would like the, uh, you know, if it's okay, I'd like to be able to turn my camera off. I'm paying attention. I'm taking notes. It's just visually very distracting for me. Um, so we work with people on those types of accommodations. Um, I, for anybody who is interested in this, I would strongly recommend checking out Job Accommodation Network or askjan.org, which is uh, run by the Federal Bureau of Labor. And uh, they just on Thursday had a good, good uh, discussion on supporting neurodivergency in the workplace. And they will make that uh, video available. It was a webinar uh, here in the next week. So keep an eye out for that. And they have a whole section on job accommodations for ADHD, for autism, for uh, communication disorders, for, um, oh, what else? I mean, pretty much any kind of air quote disability you can think of, they've got information there. They're very affirming. Um, I really like them. They're a tiny bit behind. They use the term neurodiversity instead of neurodivergency, but, you know, that's new. Um, so it is, let me put that in, askjan.org. And um, they also have a hotline where you can call. So if you have a problem at work or if you're an employer with a challenge, you can call them up for advice. And from what I understand, I've never called them, but uh, they're pretty good. Anything else? This has been really, really great. Jen, tell, tell me about your staffing for Orange County. Um, do you have someone here or how, how are, are you managing the job creation down here? In, so we in don't do, so we don't do job creation. We do job development. And I think it's really important to distinguish the two. That's a really good question, Judy. So we are not going to companies and saying, hey, we have people that you need to hire. Instead, what we're doing is we're helping neurodivergent people have great resumes, a good LinkedIn profile, work on their interviewing skills, and teaching them how to look for a job okay. right? using tools like that. The reason being is um, this will not be their first job. Their, or their only job. There will be a time when they have to get another job. So we want to teach them how to do this for themselves with a whole bunch of coaching, cheerleading, and sometimes some intervention, right? But we're helping them figure out what are your skills? Look at the job opportunities. Do you have 70 to 80% of the needed skills? Um, is this a good company? Would you like working at this company? Doing some research about them. Um, can you get there? So we want them to do that problem solving with us, you know, kind of in advance as they sort through this, because we want to teach them how to do, right? So we do have somebody who is in Southern California. She is available. She lives up in Temecula, but, you know, she is aware of the area. Right. And so in an emergency, she can go out and do something. Uh, we have another person who is thinking about moving down there. But I'm not sure what her timeline is, but okay. yeah. I have another question. Um, so DOR has a number of, I'll call them uh, ways of assist to help in the placement process. Things like on the job training yeah. funding. They now have, I, I think, 100 hours of internship. Um, those kind of programs, have you been able to leverage those to help uh, individuals build up experience or, or, or find employment? So we look at them. Um, we, you know, of course, when all of these new programs or new funding streams come available, we look at all the documentation, we read through it, and we try to ascertain, is there anything we can do with this? Um, we are unusual, apparently, in that we have uh, more funding streams for DOR than your average vendor, because we've gotten really creative on <laughs> some of them, where we've like, people need this. How do we get it funded by DOR? And we've done some background uh, tinkering. 
Um, the the on the job training, you know, part of the problem is, and this is a, a failure of DOR that I, I I go postal on every now and again, is that they make it so hard to access these funds. So, for example, you know, they make all kinds of things available to companies who want to hire uh, uh, consumers of DOR, but the process is so painful that no company, I mean, you should see the invoicing we have to do for DOR. Yeah, you're talking about that. No <laughs> company is going to do that. It, it costs more money than they're going to get in return, right? You know, so it's really kind of silly. And OJT, for example, is uh, one, an example of that, where companies can get funding for training people but they have to report every month in a set format. They have to uh, submit invoices that are designed to be approved by DOR, and then they have to wait for the funding, right? So it's a lot of moving Yeah, parts. you know, I, I worked with a startup, Improve on Health, who uh, was able to fund things through the OJT program, and I got... I got involved more times than I wanted to because they weren't getting re they, they weren't getting paid and it was complicated yeah um what was I gonna oh oh I know I was going to ask you about apprenticeships so uh we had ready willing and able uh come and speak to us and I know that there's been a lot of investment in uh apprenticeship programs they have them for uh, some areas of dentistry, ophthalmo you know, uh, working with ophthalmologists or, you know, uh, at glasses places at Costco mm -hmm. or whatever. So there's a variety. Uh, I think they have medical coding and things like that. Have you um, had experience at all with any of those programs or have you referred any of your um, clients to those? Not to not to those types of. I don't even know if we have them up here. I've never heard of them. Okay. You know, it could be something, and this is something that's also very odd about California, is that things are very um, segmented, generalized. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's very regional. So, for example, we've had a lot of clients in our area over the years who really wanted to get into the trades, and um, there's virtually nothing in the Bay Area, if you're interested in construction, for example, but go over the hill to Modesto and there's tons of stuff available, yeah. right? And same thing, if you're interested in medical assisting over in uh, the Central Valley, there's virtually nothing, but you drive over the hill here and there's tons, right? So a lot of it is segmented and that's part of our problem, I think, statewide. Um, you know, I, I like jobs that, you know, kids can get into, especially ones who've struggled in high school for one reason or another, I call them starter jobs. You know, it's like, you know, you want to be a vet. Well, you know, before you apply to Davis, you know, after struggling through high school, I think it's better if you work as a medical tech, you know, and, and a vet tech and do that work. And if you love it, go back to school later. Right. Yeah. You don't have to do all of it at once. You know, we want to get kids going quickly, learning out in the world and experiencing life and then coming back and doing more education um, that works better. And also the landscape's changing. You know, I mean, there's the job, the jobs that are available now are going to look very different than the jobs that are available in eight to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions, so I think that you successfully helped everybody understand executive functioning and have a better idea of Evo Libre and your services. Jen, it's been so great to see you again and to get caught up. Um, Thank you, Judy. I really appreciate it. Wonderful meeting everybody. Like I say, if you have any further questions, just pop an email to intake um, and she'll shuffle anything to me or to anybody else in my org who's better equipped to answer it. And have a lovely spring. Enjoy our finally drier weather. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, come on Monday to the 
Neurodiversity at Work session. And thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye.